Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, and I'm joined once again by your faithful host, Josh Bertram. What's up? Well, good to be here. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and this week we are joined uh, by Mark Charles, uh, who is a dual citizen of the United States and Navajo Nation. He's an activist, public speaker, consultant, author, and reform pastor. Charles is the co-author of Unsettling Truths, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery, and regularly contributes as a correspondent for Native News Online and journalist for the wireless Hogan, Reflections from the Hogan. Um, he was an independent candidate for president of the United States in the 2020 presidential election, and we are happy to have him on. So, yeah, it's a... Well, yeah, hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, if I could, can I introduce myself uh, more traditionally before we yeah. begin? So, yeah, eh, Mark Charles Yenishia, Sin Bake Dene Nishle, Dotol Higlini Bashishin, Sin Bake Dene Dashiche, Dotol Lucini Dashinella. In our Navajo mm. culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people, with our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say Sin Bake Dene. Loosely translated, that means I'm from the Wooden Shoe people. <laughs> <laughs> my, my second clan, my father's mother, is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Sin Bake Dene. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I also want to acknowledge I'm speaking to you from what's now called Washington, D.C., but these are the traditional lands of the Piscataway, and I want to honor the Piscataway as the hosts of the lands where I'm living. I want to thank them for their stewardship of these lands, and I want to just state how humbled I am to be living on the lands of the Piscataway today. Uh, th yeah, thank you. That, 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 that's yes, really awesome. You. And, and, and uh, um, I, I want to kind of get your critique. Was my pronunciation okay? <laughs> so it's Yate. Um, yeah, it was a little bit off, but not bad for a first start. So, <laughs> I literally right before this recording, Yate. I was I was like I I, I I typed it in. I was listening to the recording. I was pronouncing it. I was like, oh, I'm gonna nail it. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get this. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you for your uh, for your honest and in and, and candid. Um, evaluation. Uh, so, 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 Mark, t tell me, like, what, what, what made you kind of like, you know, pursue this level of activism um, um, and and all the stuff that you do? So, it was never my goal to be an activist or even to be gay, be engaged politically. Um, when my wife and I were dating, right, and talking about what our goals, our vision for our lives were, and what we wanted to do, and I was telling her, my goal is I want to encourage the church. I want to, I want to encourage the church to become who the church is supposed to be. And I would say I would not deny I'm still doing that. I'm just doing it in a way I never thought I would be doing it. I did not think encouraging the church to be who it needs to be would involve me being engaged politically. Um, uh. dealing with some of the things the church has been complicit in and trying to walk back some of the things that the church has been not only engaged in, but also helped establish things like the doctrine of discovery, systemic racism, sexism, white supremacy, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, yeah, it wasn't, it was never a point of mine where I decided, hey, this is where I'm going to go. Uh -huh. But, well, maybe that's not true. There was probably one point where I was, I felt like I was being led to engage a bit more politically. Mm. And I actually took a year to really think through that because again, I had no intention of going that route to start with. And at the end of that year, I said, okay, I will follow this path. I have no idea where it's gonna lead or what that's gonna mean. And I have no intention of becoming a normal run of the mill politician I feel like I have some very strong prophetic things I need to say. And so if I'm going to do this, I have to find out how I'm going to do it without losing my message. Uh -huh. um, and so that was 20 years ago. But then 
I felt very like my wife and I both agreed one of the next steps for us was to move back to the Navajo Nation, which is not where you go if you want to be more engaged politically. Uh -huh. right? You don't leave the limelight, you step into it. But we moved to the reservation and lived for, there for 11 years. And it was while living there and not only experiencing the historical trauma of my people, but seeing the fruit of the doctrine of discovery and the dehumanizing policies both the church and the nation have enacted against my people and experiencing that modern day mar marginalization as well as the wrestling with all the historical trauma that came with that. And that's what really gave me the vision of what I have today to address things at a foundational level. You know, when I was running for president in 2020 as part of the, as an independent, um, uh, campaign for president. The theme of my campaign was, I said, let's build a nation where for the very first time, we the people actually means all the people. Uh -huh. You know, and I said, if we want, if we want, and most people will say we would love to have a nation that stands for equality. And most people would say our foundations, our, our, our constitution sets out this great vision of equality. We just struggle to meet it. Mm -hmm. And I was telling people all the time, if you think our constitution was meant to include everybody, get into to a diverse group of people, people of color, women, people of different um, gender identities, and read the document out loud. And you will be shocked and, and astounded, right? You'll be, you'll, be, you'll be embarrassed at how quickly our own constitution turns racist, sexist, and white supremacist. And so I said, if we want to fix these problems, we have to address them at a foundational level. Mm, yeah. And that, so that's where I've, I've spent the bulk of my time. The book I wrote with my co-author, Sing Chan Ra, On Settling Truth, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. One of the things we do very early in that book, um, chapters three and four, is we trace how the church got from the teachings of Jesus, who said radical things like pray for those who pray for your enemies and, 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 and help those who persecute you, right? It's radical things. How it got from that to a doctrine that literally said you can kill people who don't look like, sound like, act like, or worship like you. And mm. the thread we found was mm. unbelievable. Chapters three and four, especially for Christians, is a paradigm changer because it shows how going all the way back to the writings of Eusebius, who was pre-Constantine, right? Mm. He's the one who baptized Constantine. How going back to his writings, we see the introduction of this notion of a heretical kingdom known as Christendom or Christian empire, um, mm. as he was working to kind of stop the persecution of the Christians. And so you trace that thread all the way through. And once you understand that thread, then it makes perfect sense why the church is wrestling with the things it's wrestling with today. <laughs> yeah. Because we've yeah. been in bed with empire, I would argue, for 1,600 years. Since Constantine. Yeah. Going yeah. all the way back to, to Eusebius and Constantine. And yeah. so chapters three and four of Unselling Truth is a paradigm shifter for Christians because it shows how the roots of that. And one of the things we do in my book, right? I, I say this all the time is I always warn my audiences, you know, as we speak, I'm going to offend you. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're on the left or the right, if you're, if you're liberal or conservative, um, I'm going to offend you. And if you're afraid I'm picking on you too much and the person sitting next to you is getting off easy, sit tight because in five <laughs> minutes, they will feel like I'm picking on them and you will be smiling more smugly. And so I, I worked very hard to give a bipartisan critique and to show how the things that we that we attack each other as the left and the right are actually at its at its base common values both sides hold, and they're because they're written into both the theologies of the church and even the foundations of the country. Yeah, yeah Man, that, it's uh, absolutely amazing. I um. <clears throat> It's so fascinating. Number one, I think you're the first Navajo um, that I've met personally. 
So thanks for that opportunity. <laughs> You're very welcome. I'm serious. I mean, I'm not trying to say that. It's a little tongue in cheek, but it's not really because it's uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, and uh, I'm fascinated by the language. I love languages, and um, like I've I've taken Greek and Hebrew and uh, Spanish and Latin and things like that. And I, I just love languages. So it's really cool to hear. I just love the way it sounds. It's such a, yeah. it's such an interesting interesting language. You know. <clears throat> We're going to get into the doctrine of discovery in and everything there. And there's so many questions that I have, especially with you as like a as a pastor and a reformed pastor at that. So it's interesting. So it's going to be a lot of questions. Talk to me about I mean, I'm super interested. I want to get into the book, of course. But what tell me about your journey? How did you move from being like, how did you come into really getting your identity as a Navajo and solidifying that? Was that from a young age? Or just kind of tell me about your story and how did you uh, become a reformed pastor? I'm yeah. really interested. Well, so, I mean, one of the questions, and a, a similar question I get frequently that people ask me is, why are you a Christian? Right? Because the church has done horrible, genocidal, oppressive things to your people. Why would you take on the faith of your colonizers? And for years, I would tell the story of how my grandparents, on my Navajo side, my father's parents, they were both boarding school survivors, right? The boarding schools were these institutions run by both the church and the government, and they were established to forcibly assimilate Native children to Western culture. They were taken from their homes. They were punished for speaking their languages. You know, the, the stories of abuse come out of out of the boarding schools, the mental, physical, emotional, sexual abuse that came out is gut wrenching. And my grandparents survived the boarding schools. And it was through that that they got introduced to Christianity. And they embraced the Christian faith. And they uh, my they went on to work with the missionaries of the CRC in the Southwest. My grandmother helped plant one of the early churches on our reservation. What is the CRC? The Christian Reformed Church. Christian Reformed Church, Christian Reformed okay. Church of North America, yeah. So they, they've they been running a mission compound on our reservation for over 100 years. Oh, my goodness. And wow. so my grandmother helped plant one of the earlier churches in the, in the, the mid-20th um, century. My grandfather worked with the translators. He helped translate the Bible into Navajo. Um, so, right, so there's a legacy of, of on my Navajo side of my, my family being members of the church and following, wow. following wow. Christ and being Christians. And I've told that story and I've talked a lot about even the frustration my grandfather had of working with the white missionaries, how they never treated him as an equal. And they always were, he was kind of off, pushed off to the side and the challenges he felt and struggled with really until he died with that marginalization from the own the very denomination he was serving but two weeks ago actually about a month ago i was back in in uh grand rapids michigan i was at calvin university and seminary at the worship symposium which is actually one of the most uh um uh broad things the christian Reformed church does is their worship symposium they have once a year run by the calvin institute of christian worship john whitvliet is the organizer of that he's been a great friend for over a decade and i've been a part of that worship symposium for a long time and this year i wasn't speaking at it but a friend of mine from australia who's aboriginal who i've known for over a, almost for 20 years who has been wrestling with, like me myself, what does it mean to be authentically Aboriginal and authentically a Christian? And we've been on a journey together along with many other people. And he was asked that question of why are you a Christian? The church has been so horrible to you. And his response blew my mind because it was radically honest in a way I've never heard before. And he said, the reason I'm a Christian is because that's who colonized us. Had we been colonized by Islam, I'd be a Muslim. Had we been colonized by Buddhists, I'd be a Buddhist. Had we been colonized by Hindus, I'd be a Hindu. He said, that's who colonized us, and that's who, therefore, I converted to their religion. 
He said, but today I am interrogating my faith to find out if this faith allows me to be authentically Aboriginal and authentically a follower of Christ. And I asked him, I said, why did you use the word interrogate instead of investigate or explore? He said, because those words are too passive. He said, I am holding this thing to trial. I am interrogating what this faith believes or states to believe. And because, right, what it states to believe and the way we were treated by its missionaries are completely different. Uh -huh. And so I'm trying to interrogate what does it mean. And the thing that fascinated about me, fascinated me about that statement is I realized that's exactly what I'm doing. Right, my grandparents, I mean, why am I a Christian? I was raised in a Christian home on both sides of my family, both longtime members of the Christian Reformed Church, right? I don't even remember when I first said the prayer, mm. right? I know different points in my walk of faith where I began to own it more, and I began to know when I began to ask questions of what does it mean to be Navajo and be a Christian. But as far as being a Christian, that's been my entire life experience. And so I realized that, yeah, that's because my grandparents were boarding school survivors. And the way you survive the boarding school is you converted, right? When you have uh -huh. a gun to your head, that's the way you survive. Yeah. You convert. And the problem is, is my grandparents always worked under the authority of the white missionaries. And they were never given the room. They never took the space to interrogate this faith that they embraced uh -huh. and say, does this faith really include? Because the missionaries didn't include them. They accepted a subservient role under the missionaries in this faith, and they never interrogated it. And I, right, I've sat with boarding school survivors. And I've heard gut-wrenching stories about what happened to them in the boarding schools. I had a very close relation with my grandparents. I lived with them for several years. They lived right next door. As they got older, I, I, I stayed in the bedroom in their house. I cared for them. I cooked for them. I ate with them. I cleaned their house. I took them shopping. I mean, I, I saw them almost as much as I saw my own family. And they never talked to me about the boarding schools. They never shared with me the stories of what they endured. And I know that their stories were just as painful as the stories I've actually heard from other people. And that they've never been able to dealt with that, deal with it, deal with it. And so I'm now doing what my grandparents never did, which is I'm interrogating this faith. If you read on Settling Truth, a lot of the, the chapters of that book are my story of faith and my wrestling with what does it mean to be a Christian. And I'm actually writing another book right now called Decolonizing Faith. Hmm. And in this book, I'm actually looking directly at the way both the church and the scriptures have been weaponized to hold my people and other people of color in states of oppression, as well as women. And so, yeah, I would say I'm, I'm in the state of, I, I still call myself a Christian. And I, 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 still, I still believe that the blood of Christ reconciles me back to creator. But I'm interrogating this institution we call the church. And I'm interrogating not only what it's taught, but the scriptures it's presented and saying, okay, what does this say about my humanity as a Gentile, right? Uh. I'm, a, I'm a Gentile. The challenge is, is I'm a Gentile to the Jews and I'm a savage to Western Christianity. Uh. And so where do these scriptures begin to include me or do they include me and what does that mean for my faith and how I practice it moving forward? So I would say I'm actually in that, you know, and I've been on a tremendous journey, even the past 20 years, how I met this gentleman who was at Kelvin with me a few weeks ago, you know, meeting him as an, as an Aboriginal from Australia. I've met with indigenous Christians from all over the world who are in the process of decolonizing their faith.
and yeah. then engaging that within the institutions of Western Christianity. I've served on the board of the Christian Reformed Church of North America. I've served on the board of CCDA. I've partnered with groups like Sojourners and and other organizations, you know, and I've I've been very engaged with the institutional church throughout the country. And now I'm interrogating that to say, okay, where is my space here? Sure. Not just relationally, but even theologically and spiritually within this this context. Yeah, I mean, that makes so much sense. And, you know, even from some of the things that you mentioned, like even the structure of the Navajo Nation in terms of clans and things like that, my sense is that you would be able to come to a document like the New Testament or any of the documents in the Old Testament, we refer to, you know, the Hebrew Scriptures and Christian Scriptures, that you would come to them and have a much better ability to understand them and to interpret them correctly than than um, just uh, kind of a run of a mill, um, or not even run of the mill, but just like a s- someone who has grown up Western is yeah. white and has Western individualism and idealism and all the things that come with Western secular society that has been obviously very influenced by Christianity profoundly and unbelievably, but at the same time, but institutionalized Christianity, yeah. as you as you said, and I do make a distinction between the institutionalization and the human element of Christianity and what they have done. Um, and, uh, and obviously the, the creator and the God that we serve. And there's so many questions I have, but I know Will's got a question. So I just want to, but what, I just wanted to mention that. What do you think about that observation? Like you're that you're the, the <clears throat> cultural milieu that you came from and understand makes you able to, yeah, naturally interpret the Bible better than and most other people. So the way I would phrase it, because I would argue, and I don't disagree with you, but my experience is I was raised as a white evangelical, right? I was raised in the right, Christian from right, church. Right. So the, the faith my grandparents embraced said you have to worship in English, right? You have to do things the Western way. And so they didn't teach the language to my father, so he didn't know what to teach it to me. And so, and they were very much, they bought into the whole lie of the, I mean, they were converted in the boarding school, right? Which is forced assimilation. And so I was raised a white evangelical, probably just as much as as you were or any other average American. But when I began to question or look deeper, I had more access to my community to begin to relate and and kind of seek that out in context. And so just one quick example is I've done discipleship, right, with believers from around the globe and been in relationship with believers from around the globe. And I was doing discipleship with a, a Messianic Jewish believer, not your white evangelical Messianic Jewish believer, but a, 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 a person who grew up and who lived within the, the traditional Jewish um, community in Israel and yet believed believed in Yeshua, not the mm. Western picture of that, but very much believed <laughs> yeah. in Jesus. And and when I went to spend some time with him in Israel, he I spent some time with him in Israel. He spent some time with me on the Navajo Nation. We kind of discipled each other. And when I got there, the first thing he said to me is he said, Mark, you've been trained as a white American, right? Which is how I grew up to read the scriptures incorrectly. Exactly. You've been trained to read the Old Testament like it was written to you. Yes. And it wasn't. Which it's not. (laughs) It was written to Jewish people, and it's about their covenantal relationship to the God of Abraham. Yes. It's not something that you can claim and apply. You can glean a ton from it, but you can't. It's not written to you. You have to read it as an outsider. Absolutely. Because, again... I'm I'm a I'm a Gentile to the Jews and I'm a savage to Western Christianity as a Navajo man, right? It's I can easily more identify with that, right? When there's there's another book about the doctrine of discovery written by a native author, his name is Stephen Newcomb, and his book is called Pagans in the Promised Land. And it's a it's a great title because it literally the title itself explains what happened to Native Americans. Right. When you read the book of Deuteronomy, how were the people told to claim their promised land? Well, they were to commit genocide. 
Leave no man, no woman, no child, no animal left alive is what God said. Right. And so and so it's easy for me to identify with the Gentiles in the Old Testament. Right. Where God is not necessarily a God of love. Right. If we had been, even both of you, you're, I assume neither of you are Jewish, had we been alive in the Old Testament, we would have been part of that ethnic cleansing, right? We would have been, had we been pagans living in the promised land, we probably would have been killed. Mm. Yeah. And so it's easier to identify with that and say, okay, I need to read these scriptures as an outsider, understanding this is about God's covenantal relationship with the people of Israel. And just that comment that he made to me was very paradigm shifting for me. And it, I, I went through several, maybe even a decade of wrestling and realizing how much I had read the Old Testament like it was written to me instead of reading it as an outsider um, and how that deeply impacted what promises I was able to claim and what theologies I was able to agree with, because so much about Western Christianity is about saying we are the new Israel and we, you know, we have a, a land covenant with the God of Abraham. We have, uh, we have promised lands and we can claim a manifest destiny, right? All of these things, which again, this goes back to the writings of Eusebius and the work of Constantine, which creates this heretical understanding of a Christian empire an earthly empire, which is what I would say the U.S. is today. So anyway, there's just one example of because I live in a nation that in its founding document, right, the Declaration of Independence, 30 lines below the statement on men are created equal, refers to Native peoples as savages, right? I have Supreme Court legal precedent based on the fact that land titles um, exist because natives aren't human, we're savages, and we don't have sovereignty over the land we held, right? So this is very much a part of what it means to be Native American today. And so it allows me to understand and relate a whole lot easier to read the Old Testament as an outsider instead of disillusionally are to be disillusioned by reading it as an insider, which is how most of Western Christianity reads that that. Yeah. Series of texts. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that that that's a that's pretty fascinating. I I could probably just listen to you talk for the whole hour. Um. Uh, yeah. But but uh, I'm I'm I want to do a little bit of term setting if 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 we can. I I noticed that you use the term Native American, um, and but I but I've also heard, you know, Native Americans referred to as Indigenous people, also referred to as Indians. Um, yeah. and I, and I'm curious if maybe you can kind of help us better understand the proper, yeah. you know, broad term that we should be using, uh, when so, referring. Yeah. I, a reason I use a lot of these terms interchangeably is because again, I'm into offending everybody. And <laughs> at some point I'm going to offend, you know, so there are some groups of people, native peoples who say native American is not accurate, right? We're not Americans. We're not native Americans. We're we're our own tribe, right? We're Navajo, we're Lakota, we're, and, and they're, that is absolutely accurate. And actually when I talk about specific tribes, I try to work very hard to name that tribe and name that nation by itself. Lakota, the Ojibwe, the, the, the Cherokee, the, the, you know, the Navajo, the Zuni, um, the Hopi, so on and so forth. So I try to do that when I can. I'm not averse to using Native American because it's a very commonly used and generally accepted term, although there are some people who will say don't use it. Um, I also talk about indigenous peoples, again, because that's who we are. There's others who may not want to use that term. I often also use frequently the term American Indian. And the reason I use that term, even though it's ac vastly inaccurate, but that's how most of the legal documents refer to us. In, uh. in the founding documents and in the treaties, we are referred to as American Indians. And so I use that term because that's how we're referred to in some of the founding and legal documents. And uh. so, yeah, I, I tend to, again, if I only used one, I would 
keep one group of people happy all the time and offend other people constantly, but I, I use them frequently. And so I often work hard to read the room and know who my audience is, right? Mm -hmm. So I always do a land acknowledgement whenever I speak and I acknowledge by, by nation the 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 um the group of people who are on that land so the Piscataue the Ojibwe the Navajo I will refer to the specifically as nation if I'm dealing with a specific history or a massacre I will talk about that nation or that tribe of people um, mm -hmm. but in general when I when I'm talking about in general I will I tend to most frequently in my writing use the word indigenous indigenous peoples but I will also use American Indian and um, Native American if it fits the context. Got it. Um, so, so, so you, you've, you've, you've talked a lot about um, this doctrine of discovery and, and I'm curious if maybe you can kind of elaborate on what, what is the doctrine of discovery and why, why should, you know, all Americans care about it? Yeah. So in the short elevator speech of who, what the doctrine <laughs> is, it's a series of papal bulls, edicts of the Catholic church. It says things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. It's a series of papal bulls written between 1452 and 1493. So essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people in those lands are less than human and their land is yours to take. So that's the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the continent and enslave the people because they didn't see them as human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in this new world and claim to have discovered it, right? The, the first sentence of the first chapter of Unsettling Truth says you cannot discover lands already inhabited. You can sure. conquer those lands, you can steal those lands, you can colonize those lands. You can't discover them unless your worldview tells you that the people already living there are not fully human. So this doctrine then gets embedded both into the theological imagination as well yeah. as the actual written foundations of this country. The doctrine of discovery is behind the notion of manifest destiny. The Doctrine of Discovery, right, is written into and influenced our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. We have Supreme Court cases referencing by name the Doctrine of Discovery as recently as 2005, right, that this is the legal precedent for land titles, right? When the, the Constitution states that the supreme law of the land are the Constitution and treaties, and so you would think if you had a land dispute where a native nation was claiming rights to land or the U.S. government was claiming rights to land, the authority for that would be the treaty, right? There would, no, there was a treaty written after this war or at this point of context which gave the rights for this and that and whatever to take place. Hmm. But because every treaty the U.S. entered into with native nations has been broken, when they are pressed legally to establish why they can claim sovereignty over this country, over this nation, this continent, their only legal justification is the doctrine of discovery. Interesting. Yeah, the, the, the Supreme Court case that you're referring to, um, is, is that the case that that involved uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Yeah, so that was the most recent case. It was 2005, Oneida Indian Nation of New York versus the city of Sherrill. And um, I have a TEDx talk online that people can watch if they want to. I, we, again, we could go into this, and but we'd be here for another uh, half hour if we <laughs> want to. But um, there's so many things we could do, so many rabbit trails we could go down. But yeah, they're, they're, the last case which I can identify, I can demonstrate to people, it's probably one of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions written in my lifetime, referencing by name the doctrine of discovery and stating that natives do not have sovereignty over our lands. And that case was, that opinion was written and delivered by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And the point I make with that mm. is, right, because people are shocked, right? well, she's a voice of dissent on a, on a increasingly, she was a voice of dissent on an increasingly conservative Supreme Court. She was fighting for the marginalized and those who were oppressed. And she was and she did, but because land titles require 
the definition that required natives to be categorized as not human, what this does is this makes white supremacy a bipartisan value, which she demonstrates very clearly. And so again, this is the problem. Like we, as a nation, we can have a debate over what do we celebrate the first part of October, Columbus Day or Indigenous Peoples Day. Like, okay, what are we gonna focus us on this one day of the year? But nobody wants to have a, the conversation about, okay, well, what about land titles, right? Because if we're going to include Native peoples, we have to address the way we establish the legal precedent for land titles. And that's something disrupted, disrupting to the entire U.S. economy. <laughs> and that's a much more difficult conversation to have. And I know because I ran for president and no one wanted to talk about it. Right. So the, media didn't want to well, cover it. the candidates do want to talk about it. No one's like, we don't know what to do with that. So we're just going to ignore well, you. So we can talk about it here. So um, and this is your this is your first campaign speech for your 2024 <laughs> um, election campaign. So help me understand again. Help me understand what what would be. So with the land title issue, what would happen had. The Supreme Court reversed, I don't know, whatever. I, I'm not aware of the decision. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. So you're going to have to educate right. me. But like if they were to just say, OK, we're reversing this. No more doctrine of discovery or this was null and void. It does. It, yeah, it was wrong. It doesn't match our values. What would be the actual practical implications for me and Will who own a house yeah. in Virginia? Um, what, what would go? What, what would happen? So the practical implications would be you would no longer have land titles. Right. Because when you break a treaty, right, when you break it, when you have a treaty that says, OK, this side will do these things and this side will gain these things. And you have an agreement that says, OK, this is what we're going to do. And that treaty gets broken. Right. What this means is you go back. You don't keep where you're at as the status quo. You go back to the agreement, which was prior. Right. So if. And so, example, even in, in the, the, the more recent cases, like in 2020, McGirt versus Oklahoma, where they were arguing, well, is, is Tulsa part of a reservation? And can, does the state of Oklahoma or the courts have the right to break a treaty? And the Supreme Court ruled, no, they don't have the right to break a treaty. And so, again, for judicial purposes, they ruled all of eastern Oklahoma was a reservation because that treaty hadn't been broken. But then they said in the ruling that the, the, the weight of breaking treaties lies on the legislature. And Congress has the right to break a treaty. And nobody, including the Supreme Court, will hold them accountable. So when you break a treaty, right, so if, if, if the Choctaw, the Cherokee have reservation lands in Oklahoma established by a treaty because they gave up lands in North Carolina or in somewhere else on the East Coast, right? And so that treaty right. gave North Carolina and the U.S. rights to those lands, and they gave a reservation to the Cherokee or the Choctaw in Oklahoma, and the, the U.S. breaks that treaty. So, yes, the the – the Cherokee lose their reservation in Oklahoma, but guess what America loses in North Carolina? Their rights to those traditional lands. Mm. So people think treaties are a native issue. They're not. You are just as dependent upon treaties as we are. It's just that because of the dysfunctional theological imagination of the doctrine of discovery, Americans believe we can break treaties and it doesn't impact us. Uh, wow, that, that, that's crazy. Dude, that is deep, man, because I'm trying to think like, you know, Will and I, I I'm assuming that the, uh, that the title on our home makes no reference to the previous... Um, indigenous people that originally oh. inhabited this land. <laughs> and so my guess is that if someone were to come and like, I'm just trying to imagine, um, you know, you'd have to convince Will and I that like, hey, 
we need to give up our land or, yeah, so, or whatever. So oh, what I don't even, I don't know what it would be. I, I mean, don't that's, know what That's what be. happened in the Supreme Court case um, right. that we were discussing where the United Indian Nation, so I'll just go through this case very quickly. The yeah, United please, Indian Nation, please. right, in, um, well, well, we'll go back to the initial ruling, right? This was in 1823. There's a okay. Supreme Court case, Johnson versus McIntosh. This is two white men of European descent. They are litigating each other over land titles. One of them acquired the land from a native tribe. The other one acquired the same land from the government. And they want to know who owned the land, right? Who had the right to sell the land, the tribe or the government? That was their question. The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court, right? This is, this is 1823. This is the John Marshall Court, right? This is the greatest, uh -huh. uh, considered one of the greatest Supreme Court jurists in our nation's history, right? They had to determine the legal precedent for land titles, so they rule that discovery is what gives title to the land. Now then, because discovery would imply that there might at least be some legal wiggle room for natives to declare, well, we were here first, so therefore we have the title. They went on in that opinion, John Marshall went on and he argued, he said, but the tribes of Indians inhabiting this country were fierce savages whose occupation was war, and whose subsistence was drawn chiefly from the forest. To leave them in possession of their country was to leave the country a wilderness. Hmm. So they basically are saying that Native Americans are occupants of this land, and Europeans, who are fully human, right? We're savages, so we're just occupants, like a bird occupies air or a fish occupies water. Mm -hmm. Europeans who legally are defined as fully human, they're the only ones who have the right of discovery to the land, so therefore they have the fee title to it. Oh. So that case in 1823 creates the legal precedent for land titles. That mm. precedent is used, and the Doctrine of Discovery is named by name in 1954, 1985, and again in 2005. And so it's interesting, whenever a question of native sovereignty comes up legally, they don't go back to the treaties, because all those treaties were broken. They go mm. back to the doctrine of discovery, and the Supreme Court has stated that, yeah, we can break treaties with native nations and give up nothing. That's our right. That's our jurisdiction. Because we already have discovery over this continent, we can give up our we can break our treaties and not have to return the lands that we acquired through the treaty <laughs> so crazy yeah uh i, I mean to, to be honest mark like you're 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 starting to make an activist out of me um so well done uh, <laughs> but I, I i'm i'm curious you know like like we hear a lot in the news about republicans um you know, cries about CRT being taught in schools and whatnot. Um, and I, and I'm curious if, if there is a similar type of theory, critical theory that applies to, uh, indigenous people that you feel should be taught in schools, because like, I'll, I'll be honest, like growing up, um, going to public school, I, whether it was taught explicitly or implied, yeah. like I, I walked away from a lot of my history classes thinking cowboys good, Indians bad, you know, yeah. and and uh, and I'm curious if 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 you feel, you know, there's something missing in our public education system about indigenous people that we really should should be be teaching. Yeah, there absolutely is. And there's so many ways that we can go about this. Right. I mean, first of all, most of our history has been purely erased. The best way I can describe this to you is, and we actually address this in chapters 9 and 10 of our book, there's an understanding, a common understanding that the victors write the history, right? Uh -huh. If you win a war, you get to write about the war. So in chapters 9 and 10, we address that understanding and apply it and ask the question, okay, let's pretend Nazi Germany wins World War II. Let's just pretend that happened, okay? Had they won World War II, how would the Nazi historians had recorded the legacy of Adolf Hitler? Well, he would be their greatest leader ever, right? Had Nazi Germany won World War II, 
how would Nazi historians had recorded the Holocaust? Well, we have Holocaust deniers today. Imagine if they won the war, right? What Holocaust? There was no Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge, what makes chapters 9 and 10 so over-the-top difficult to read is we take that well-accepted understanding and we apply it to our country. So the challenge we face as a nation is we've never lost a war that matters, right? We've never been... Um, disarmed, we've never um, been occupied, we've never given up large tracts of land, right? We've won every major conflict that we've been a part of. Technically, the Korean War is not over. Um, we pulled out of Vietnam, we pulled out of Afghanistan, but we lost no land in that, right? We just, we just pulled out of a foreign conflict, had a bit of a black eye but and a bruised ego, but not much else. And so we've one, every war we've been engaged in for the past 250 years, meaning we've been able to write our own history for 250 years. And so what we've done with our history is exactly what we just imagined Nazi Germany would have done to theirs. Huh. And so chapters 9 and 10, the reason those chapters are so difficult is we apply that principle to Abraham Lincoln who is considered bipartisan to be one of the greatest presidents in our nation's history, right? Who is considered by both Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, right? He is the model American. Yes, he had some racist views early on, but he built this friendship with Frederick Douglass and he went on to abolish slavery and he died. He was assassinated on Good Friday. He died for fighting for equality, right? We have this whole mythology about Abraham Lincoln. And, and uh, the challenge is, is because we've never lost a war that matters, we've written our own history, most of what we know about Lincoln is myth, not fact. And in chapters 9 and 10, going through his speeches, starting with the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but going through his entire career up until he was assassinated, we demonstrate that Abraham Lincoln was a self-proclaimed, unapologetic, and blatant white supremacist by his own words. We also demonstrate after 1862 when he was in office and he signed the Homestead Act, the Pacific Railway Act, and he went through and literally ethnically cleansed natives from the states of Minnesota, from Utah and Idaho, from Colorado, and from New Mexico and Arizona, which were the northern, the central, and the southern routes of the Transcontinental Railway. He was also one of the most genocidal presidents in our nation's history. Wow. And we actually don't even hide this, right? If you go to the Lincoln Memorial, at the base of that memorial, there's a small museum at the base of the memorial. And on, on each wall, there are plaques with different parts of Abraham Lincoln's legacies, quotes in them, things that he said, things that he's advocated for. And on one wall, there's a plaque <clears throat> with, or there's five plaques with his quotes on the union. And at the middle of that wall is a plaque that says, I would preserve the union. My primary object in this struggle is not to save or destroy slavery, it's to save the Union. If I could save the Union without freeing a single slave, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. There's a plaque hanging at the Lincoln Memorial that literally celebrates the fact that he did not believe black lives mattered. We're not That's lamenting crazy. that, we're not trying to wrestle with that. We are celebrating that and we're putting it up on the memorial where we have this, these national debates about equality and race. And yet the guy who we're, we're demonstrating our dialogue in front of, I mean, when he introduced himself, right, in the Lincoln Douglas debates, he said, I have no intention of making voters or jurors of Negroes or allowing them to hold office or to intermarry with white people. He said, I have no intention of, of, of you know, uh, 
there's a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living on terms of social and political equality. And as long as they must remain together, there has to be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. He said that. This was 1858. Why would he say that introducing himself in the Senate debates in 1858? Well, what happened in 1857? Dred Scott. The entire debate of the midterm elections of 1858 was about Dred Scott. Do our foundations apply to black people? And Abraham Lincoln is stating very clearly he agreed with Dred Scott. This is crazy. Uh, I mean, I've been to the Lincoln Memorial a ton of times, and and maybe it's just because I went yeah, there with my I kids. Too. Like, I I haven't read the plaques or anything like that. But you know what? Like, good good on us for putting him on the penny. I mean, who uses pennies? Who well, uses? We pennies? can't take him off the penny because Illinois refuses to let us get rid of the penny. We can't. The penny is a useless <laughs> coin, and Illinois refuses to oh, let us get rid dude. of the penny because Lincoln's on there. You know, it's funny, like. I often think I do the um, the thought experiment of imagining myself, you know, back in, you know, the pre, you know, antebellum South or something like that, or, you know, back in the Roman times, um, you know, being a, and I imagine, you know, I would be one of the guys that made the right choice, you know, I would be one of the guys that went against all the all of the uh, pressures of society, all the cultural trends and streams and all the uh, majority culture and whatever. And I would, um, and I'd be the one that would stand up against. I said that to a historian on this show and kind of tongue in cheek, but he said, yeah, no, you wouldn't. And neither would I. <laughs> and he, he's like the people that uh, changed history were very radical yeah. in their, a lot of times in their views. And my question that you might anticipate is what, what, at what level do you think, like for someone like Abraham Lincoln, obviously we look at his views and think, think them objectively wrong. Like those things that you just viewed. Um, and I, I do think that they are wrong. Um, my question is to what level do you think, I mean, we're, we're products of our history. And so how does that, how does that, how does the historical context of someone like Lincoln or anyone, I mean, honestly, um, how does that play into um, how we make a historical judgment about him and like, or anyone? I don't was know. If, is that making of his time, right? Was he just a product of his yeah, time? Yeah. And, and not exactly. I don't want to excuse things, right? Cause that's what you don't want to do. They're just yeah. products of their time so they can rape, pillage and do whatever. And it wasn't a big deal. We shouldn't be upset at them for it. And that's, that's not what I'm saying. Cause I don't think that's right. But I, I just always wonder about that. Like, yeah, what did he do? Does it negate what he did? What yeah. his views are? What's, I mean, we're all just, obviously we probably made him into like, we put him up on a pedestal that he probably never should have been on because so, he's a person. So and anyway, again, go ahead. We don't have time to go into all of the ins and outs here. Totally, totally. But I, as part of my lectures now, I include in almost every lecture I give on the Doctrine of Discovery, thirty-five to forty minutes specifically on Lincoln. Mm. I first go through and prove beyond almost a shadow of a doubt that he was a blatant white supremacist, unapologetic and and mm. and self-proclaimed. Um, and I, I demonstrate that through his words, through his speeches, through the things he did, through what we even claim about him. And then we go through and go through all of his Indian policies and the massacres, and then we map them out and show where they took place. And again, it's just, it mm. becomes so clear. So the last massacre that he, he enacted was the massacre at Sand Creek, which was on, um, which was on November 29 of 1864. The Cheyenne and Arapaho were on their treaty lands and they were at Sand Creek um, and they were waving a white flag of surrender and an American flag to show that they were there peacefully. A Union army led by a Methodist pastor came over the hill. The warriors, the young men of the tribe were out hunting. So it was women and children and elders who were there. 
and they ordered the the Union Army general ordered all of them slaughtered. There is actually proof demonstrated that they, the soldiers in celebration of the massacre, paraded the genitalia of the Cheyenne Rapaho down the streets of Denver to celebrate this massacre. Wow. Right? This is the final one. Okay? Now, again, in 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed the Pacific Railway Act and the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act allocated 160 acres and we're willing to go west and homestead for five years. The Pacific Railway, Railway Act allocated the land and the resources to complete the Transcontinental Railway. Okay? So, on, on April, on November 29, 1864, this final massacre, which helps clear the way for the central route to get through Colorado, takes place. A week later, one week later, in his annual address on December 6 of 1864, Abraham Lincoln reports that 1.5 million acres were entered under the Homestead Law and the great enterprise of connecting the Pacific states by rail, the Atlantic with the Pacific states by railway and telegraph lines has been entered upon with a vigor that gives assurance of success. He is now openly confident that we're going to complete Manifest Destiny and the Transcontinental Railway because this massacre has just taken place. Oh. And so what I've learned about Lincoln is I can't deconstruct him in part because he is not only our greatest president, he's our Messiah figure. He represents the salvation of our country, going from a, a country with enslavement to a country without enslavement. And so the reason I address him for two chapters in this book and for 45 minutes in my lecture is because if I don't deconstruct Lincoln completely, people will cling to him like their physical and their spiritual lives depend on it. It doesn't even matter their faith tradition. He's what keeps the mythology of America intact. And so, and so I have to do a very thorough deconstruction of him. And I have to make people wrestle with, yeah, this is what he said and this is what he did. And not only that, but this is the reason why we celebrate him. Right? This is why both the left and the right consider him our greatest thing ever, because he literally gave us the tools that we're using today to keep people of color marginalized. Right? The 13th Amendment doesn't abolish slavery. It redefines and codifies it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime. Wherever the party has been building, this is the justice system that has the highest incarceration rate today of any country in the world and incarcerates people of color at three to five times the rate it incarcerates white people. This was the vision of Abraham Lincoln. He didn't know what to do with these formerly enslaved people who he was freeing through ending chattel slavery, but he had no intention of making them full citizens of the country, and it was impractical to send them back to Africa. So what was he to do? Well, there's where we get the clause in the 13th Amendment, which keeps enslavement legal in our criminal justice system and gives white supremacy a place to be constitutionally protected. That was his vision. Because yeah, he didn't know what else to do with these people of color who had no no idea, no no intention of making them normal citizens. Yeah, Lincoln probably would have been okay with Jim Crow laws, huh? Oh, he, he gave us the tool to create them. That was the entire vision of the 13th Amendment. Yeah, Again, that's... he agreed with Dred Scott. Yeah. Crazy. That's oh. how he introduced himself. So, so Mark, um, uh, my, my last question, and uh, just, just so we can kind of be sensitive to time here is, uh, you know, I know that through your activism and your book and others that probably do, you know, similar work, like, um, like, maybe you can talk about sort of the level of representation or lack thereof representation, you know, in DC, in Congress. Uh, like who, who, who are advocates that that can help 
level the playing field, so to speak. So this is the challenge. And this is where our book, one of the reasons I'm convinced our book is not a New York Times bestseller is because Sun and I make a bipartisan critique. <laughs> right, if we want yeah. to have a new a bestseller, we would have only critiqued the left or only critiqued the right. Uh, yeah, we critique both, and so no one wants to deal with it. And so the challenge that I face here is these values of racism, of sexism, and white supremacy. Right? We have Ruth Bader Ginsburg acknowledging the doctrine of discovery. Right? We have Donald Trump breaking treaties with Native nations, um, with the Wampanoag Nation in 2020. Right. We have both sides are, are advocating for these things, even the whole notion of white Christian nationalism. I want to share this quote with you because we're having a debate today about white Christian nationalism. And the bulk of that blame is being put on the foot on the uh, in, in front of the feet of white evangelicals. And I don't disagree that white evangelicals have done a lot and they know they've done it right they they know they know that they've supported and voted for something that is contrary to what their own scriptures talk about they're very aware of that i one of the biggest events on my book tour was in orange city iowa right i mean i i i speak <laughs> regularly to white evangelicals um and i i know very much what's going on there they're very aware of what's going on um, and so, you know, for example, after uh, the lynching of George Floyd, right, we had the, the clearing of, of the, there was protests going on around police violence, including in Lafayette Park in, in Washington, D.C. And on June 1st of 2020, law enforcement goes in and they aggressively clear Lafayette Park. And Donald Trump, a few hours later, walks out across the park stands in front of what St. John's Church, holds up his Bible upside down at first, he turns it around, <laughs> takes a picture, and walks back, right? Has, says hardly nothing. And he was called out immediately for what he was doing, which was he was giving a dog whistle to white Christian nationalists, right? And, and that was very clear. It was very blatant. And he was called out immediately. Now, in that election, Joe Biden was running as the antithesis to Donald Trump. Right. He said, if you elect me, I will bring statesmanship back into the White House. I will speak in more complete sentence structures. I will um, <laughs> I will not um, do my foreign policy over Twitter. Right. I will I will bring this. I will be a statesman in the White House. And he got elected based on that. And he got tested in 2021 when there was a, a terrorist attack in Afghanistan. It was a it was a, a major ter attack. Several U.S. service members lost their lives. And after the attack, uh, President Biden had to address it. And so he gave a speech. And in his speech, he said this. He said, to those who carried out this attack, as well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. I will defend our interests and our people with every measure at my command. Now, had I not told you who said that, everyone would assume that was this quote by Donald Trump or another Republican. The difference is, or the challenge is, is doesn't matter which side. And actually, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, once they both get scared, they sound and talk very, very similarly. Listen to how Joe Biden responds to reporters when he's asked about his children. Uh -huh. Almost the same as Donald Trump. After this terrorist attack, he says, I'm going to use every measure at my command. Now, just two months ago, right, the nation was in an uproar because Vladimir Putin said the same thing. In Ukraine, he said, if I feel my country is being threatened or my people are being threatened, I will use every measure at my command to protect my country. And the West, especially here in the, the United States and D.C., people are like, aghast. How can you speak that way? You're a nuclear power. How dare you talk that way? That's threatening nuclear warfare. Well, this is how our presidents talk all the time. So first of all, we have to note the way he spoke. He goes on in his speech and he thanks the Secretary of the Defense and the military leadership and uh, appreciates their, their um, unanimous work to bring this to a conclusion. And then he says to those who have served through the ages and drawn inspiration from those who have served through the ages have drawn inspiration from the book of Isaiah 
when the Lord says, Whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? And the American military has been answering for a long time, Here am I, Lord, send me. Here I am, send me. In his State of the Union, Joe Biden used the word sacred twice. He talked about the Capitol as a sacred space to give a speech, and he talked about our sacred obligation to care for our veterans. I don't disagree. We have an absolute moral obligation to take better care of those who fight wars on our behalf. But Joe Biden used the word sacred. Why would he bring in the aspect of the divine regarding our veterans? Well, because he believes the U.S. military is the army of the Lord. Responding to a prophetic call on par with Isaiah the prophet. Right? If you think white Christian nationalism is a partisan problem to be laid only at the feet of white evangelicals, you're watching way too much CNN and MSNBC. <laughs> right? They're not going to tell you these things because it would ruin their bottom line. They would lose viewership. Fox News doesn't have the theological acumen to make this analysis. <laughs> right? So we don't know how to have this debate when white Christian nationalism is at the center of who, how we identify as a nation. It's a bipartisan value. It's a bipartisan problem, but we talk about it like it's a partisan problem, actually an individual partisan problem. And if we can just vote this person out of office or, or, or decenter that single individual, we're going to fix it. And that is so far from the truth. We don't recognize how these things, whether it's land titles, whether it's white supremacy, whether it's who we celebrate and what we celebrate as a nation, or whether it's white Christian nationalism, these are our core values as a country written into our foundations and celebrated by both parties and people of both conservative and liberal religious beliefs. Wow. Um, so, so, man, um, are you running for president? Uh, again in 2024? Because if so, this would be a great time to announce it. So I have been watching very closely, right? And I, I still am convinced when I ran in 2020, the theme of my campaign was I wanted to build a nation where we the people means all the people. I wanted to address things at a, at a foundational level. And I felt like one of the best ways to do it was not only through a campaign, but through being elected president. Right? I, wasn't, I wasn't running a protest campaign. I truly believed I was the best candidate and I had the best solutions to what we needed to address as a, as a nation. I still believe that. The, the things I learned out of 2020 is, first of all, it's impossible to have an adult conversation with Donald Trump in the room. It's just impossible. The media cannot help itself but to cover every absurd and narcissistic thing that he says. Right. CNN was just as upset as Fox News when he left office because they lost their gravy train. Right. I mean, they, they had a, a, a guaranteed nightly highlight reel of things they could say and talk about. And they lost that when he left daily political life. Um, and so I'm not. I don't think I could change the dialogue with Donald Trump and Joe Biden at the center of that conversation. I also learned that because I would I ran as an independent and I'm convinced I'm 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 adamant to run outside the two party system that I don't I did not have a large enough platform and I was not able to gain platform through the presidential campaign process. When you run as a Democrat or as a Republican, you have their kind of infrastructure to help build up your voice, right? Through the primary mm -hmm. systems and those things. But because I, I was running outside that, and because the things I were talking about were so foundational and not only required explanation, but were things our nation didn't want to talk about, it was easier for both the parties as well as the media, rather than attack me, it was actually better for them to ignore me. And I didn't have enough of a, of a wave of, of support or platform where I had to be included, right? So it was easier just to, if they, even if they attacked me, I would, I would, that would still bring attention to me and they didn't want to do that. So I was ignored throughout the campaign. And so 
as I'm looking going into the 2024 election and people are, are, are beginning to decide what they're going to do and Trump's already announced and, and uh, Nikki Haley's announced and a few others have announced, um, I'm thinking I'm going to sit out 2024. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to look at the longer game. So I'm, I, I don't think I will, I think if I ran again in 2024, because my platform has not grown significantly and because it's going to include the very same characters who were involved in 2020 and the media is going to be obsessing over one of those characters. I'm like, I think if I ran again, I wouldn't be able to change the outcome. Um, I think I would, I would, I would campaign in the same level of obscurity we had in 2020. Yeah. So Mm. I'm playing the long game and thinking, okay, what can I do outside of a political campaign now to elevate these topics, to bring them more to the center of our national dialogue? And then maybe in 2028 or beyond Will it be, a, can we reevaluate and make it and decide, yeah, to enter in at that point? But at the moment, I'm thinking because of the way it looks like things are going to shape up in, you know, and if Joe Biden announces, which most likely he will do, he will get very little opposition. He'll get some, but very little opposition from the left. Oh, Marion Williamson. I mean, oh, she's she, already she, yeah, she announced <laughs> already. Yeah. But again. Yeah. yeah. Well, here, here's, here's my recommendation. Um, if you do run, run on a platform that you will declassify all the files on UFOs, um, <laughs> and and you'll you'll get national attention, and people will probably vote for that. You know, <laughs> that's a freebie. Well, so again, yes. this is where I, I I am committed to not being a normal politician, <laughs> right? And exactly. not just saying things to get like so. I, you know, if I were president, and yet because of the way I campaigned and the support I got and the things I did, I was boxed in and not able to advocate for the things I felt like, that would be a waste of, of, of that work. I mean, I'm, I'm listening to, on Audible right now, President Obama's book, A Promised Land. Uh-huh. And there's many in the African-American community and other communities of color who felt like, and even he acknowledges he could have addressed race more directly. But he, he, he reports in the book that they made the conscious decision to not center his voice on racial issues. And his entire presidential campaign hinged, the strategy that they came up with, it hinged on him winning Iowa. Now, Iowa is the fifth whitest state in the country, and Uh they have the highest rate of private lands of any state in the country. Uh So he had to make himself palatable, and he had a year to do it, to white landowning men. Uh And you don't make yourself palatable to white landowning men without decentering the dialogue around race. Yeah, that's true. Which is what he did. Mm-hmm. And so there's listening to his book, there's many ways, I think, I don't know if I would say he would go as far as regretting it, but he acknowledges he missed some opportunities because he of the way he got to office. Uh-huh. Yeah. And for me, I'm like, there's no point being in office. If I want to take baby steps inching forward towards change, that's happening already. I, that's, I, that's happening. I'm saying I think we can get this change within a lifetime, but we have to address the address our nation differently. And so my whole goal is to is to if I'm going to be there, it's because I want to talk directly about these things and yeah. I don't want to push them off to the side. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mark, for spending some time with us. I swear we I could spend another hour with you, but um we just can't yeah, right now, but uh, we would definitely love to have you back on the show at some point in time. To, yes, love to connect like, 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 like a part two of this conversation. <laughs> yeah, so, I would love um, that. I'm actually I'm writing a second book right now called Decolonized Faith, Decolonizing Faith. And it's it's looking even more directly at the church. Uh-huh. And so there's a lot of 
this is yeah, that'll be great putting some twists on some of the themes i've talked about and even so i'm gonna i'm really looking forward to this next year to year and a half of writing this book but also one of my goals of the next year next two years is to engage our nation nationally with not only the legacy of lincoln but why we celebrate lincoln mm -hmm. Oh, and there you go, dude. I'm looking to take that conversation much more nationally in the next two years. You're gonna have to put your <clears throat> you're gonna have to put your uh, fighting gloves on. <laughs> well, again, I'm looking to not that I want to be attacked, but I at least sure, want to no, be recognized you. as someone who of course. who should who need you need to have an opinion on rather than just someone who can be ignored. Sure. Um, yeah. How how uh, how can people learn more about you? um you know where, where where can they go yeah so on my website uh this is the best place it's kind of a central place wirelesshogan.com w-i-r-e-l-e-s-s-h-o-g-a-n.com wirelesshogan.com that's my website that has links to all of my social media people can actually buy signed copies of my book on wirelesshogan.com on my website and i'm actually doing what i call my book study special where if groups want to study my book in the group of 10 or so if they buy 10 signed copies from my website i will give their study group a 45 minute virtual q a in the oh. next year oh, nice. that they can schedule with me so it's been a great way for not only for people to engage more in depth with me but for me to engage with the people who are reading my book and to mm -hmm. have conversations and go deeper in some of the questions so yeah, That's I'm, awesome. I'm on most social media as Wireless Hogan. Um, on my YouTube channel, which again is Wireless Hogan, several days a week I do my second cup of coffee where I sit right here, drink my cup of coffee, and talk about the social, political, and um, uh, religious events of the day. Later this week, um, uh, actually tomorrow I'm talking with Shane Claiborne. Next week I'm talking with another Native activist named Sarah Augustine. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of ways. If you Google my name, Mark Charles, um, or Mark Charles Navajo, you'll get a lot of my videos, a lot of my documents, and a lot of my social media. Awesome. Great. That's really awesome. Well, well, thanks again, Mark, for your time, your expertise, your knowledge. Um, and uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we love having you on and love to have you on again. So, um, and for, to all of our listeners and viewers out there, yeah, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Yes, Take thanks. Care.